Welcome back to PC Builder, I'm Jason. This is our February 2024 Q&A, and man, we have some insane questions. I should just call this the GPU episode, because first off, we're talking about the GPU market. There are some huge price cuts out there in the GPU market, AMD slashing prices, Nvidia cutting prices. Which GPU should you be focused on? We'll also talk about the next generation of cards. Do we expect this trend to continue? And we'll talk a lot about GPU maintenance. When should you think about undervolting, overclocking, and repasting your graphics card? Remember. If you get value out of this video, give it a like so it makes a huge difference to the channel, especially this guy right here. And of course, subscribe, click that bell icon. That way you get notified when we release cool content. With that, Let's jump into it. This video is sponsored by Deepcool's new Mystique AIO coolers with amazing LCD screen. Available in 240 and 360 millimeter versions, the Mystique AIO's high performance pump and redesigned cold plate offer maximum performance at minimal noise. Access the ultimate in personalization with the Mystique AIO's 2.8 inch high resolution LCD screen to display system stats, cool images, or even fun videos using Deepcool's sleek control center software. If you want high performance cooling and maximum personalization, check out the Mystique AIO using the link in the video description. Let's start off where else GPU market, GPU prices, Radish official asks, are the super cards, RTX 4000 series super cards, even worth considering when buying a GPU now, ignoring the 4070 super, let's not ignore the 4070 super, that's an important addition as well. But I think if you take a look at the GPU market, we'll talk a little bit about AMD's response in just a moment, because there are some serious price cuts on the AMD side as well, because of the super series cards coming out. Let's start with that 4070 super. I think it's a terrible value. I think it's a terrible value. I don't, I guess I disagree with so many other folks out there who look at this card, and say, oh, it's slightly faster than the 7800 XC. Yeah, but they also, not only is $100 more than 7800 XC, they raise the price over the 4070 to get you that. So you got a, a nice little speed boost, that's great, but you still have 12 gigs of VRAM. And that's the problem I've continuously had with that card, and the 47 before it. Now, I hope the 4070 goes down to more like $500. I'd like to see it down there. I think that becomes kind of more of a viable option for $500. Spending $600 for 12 gigs of VRAM feels super bad in 2024. In many ways, it feels like kind of a repeat of the 3078 gigabyte versus the RX 6800 non-XT 16 gigabyte debate, or even the 3080 10 gigabyte, right? Versus the 6800 XT 16 gigabyte. And like, oh, the NVIDIA card slightly faster. Yeah, but Think about people who spent like a small fortune to buy a 3080 10 gigabyte card because you did not get that card at MSRP. Not like you got the 6800 XT at MSRP either, obviously. But you spent a small fortune on that GPU thinking, I'm not going to have to upgrade my GPU for like four or five years. And now you're like, yeah, if you want to run Alan Wake 2 at ultra settings at 1440p, you, on release, guess what? You run out of VRAM because you only have 10 gigs and that, that uses much closer to 12 gigs of VRAM. And you're like, what, what? Wait a second. I thought I was buying this GPU for the next five years and it didn't even barely last two and a half years on me. I'm not so worried about this generation uh, with 12 gigs of VRAM. I think like eight gigs it will, or 10 gigs, it'll last a couple of years, sure. But what happens when the new consoles come out in 2026 and they've got significantly more VRAM than the ones do now and the companies are optimizing console first, then PC. It used to be the other way around. And I think PC gamers are a little stuck in that older mentality. We got to get with the time. I still think PC gaming is a far superior game, far superior gaming experience than console. If you look now, a lot of the console games are, they feel almost unplayable at times. The frame rates are so low. I just feel like the 4070 Super 12 gigabyte just isn't going to last. And you're spending $600 on a GPU that's not going to last. And I just, I don't like it. It is what it is. I don't think it's a good value, but let's talk about the ones that are a good value. 4070 Ti Super, two thumbs up. I think that's a great value. Although AMD is now slashing the price of the 7900 XT down to about that $700 mark. So I think we got a lot of competition there, but the 4070 Ti Super now with 16 gigs of VRAM to me becomes a very, very good GPU. The 4070 Ti, again, $800 for 12 gigs of VRAM also felt really dumb. $600 feels dumb, but $800 felt even dumber. Even though the 4070 Ti Super only increased performance by a hair, 
the most important feature on that card is the four extra gigs of VRAM, which to me just means that you're gonna be able to own that GPU and use it for many more years to come without compromises. I know you can turn down textures and shaders, but who's spending $800 on a GPU just to turn down textures and shaders and, and details a couple years from now? So that's why I think that's a good value. I think the 4080 just coming down to $1,000, it still sucks in terms of its value. Clearly there is a market for it because they're selling out. So I think the 4080 is super. There's no real performance difference between the two. Basically, they just lowered the price and they called it a new thing. They called it the 4080 Super. So I have no problem with that card. I think it's also a good card out there. And I think AMD needs to cut some prices. So overall, I think that's been the impact of the GPU market where Nvidia produced two GPUs really worth looking at, but they kind of really failed in the mid range. Oh, Coder asks, our price is going down in the GPU market. After what NVIDIA did with this 4070 series, I think you mean over the summer, right? Will there be a different future for the 50 series in terms of price to performance? And is VRAM going to be increased? That's like three different questions. Start with VRAM. Yes, VRAM is going to go up. Look, are there gonna be eight gigabyte cards in the next generation at the ultra low? Probably, probably, I can't say that for sure but there are some engineering challenges to adding additional VRAM on some of these cards with super tight memory buses. They're gonna have to figure that out from an engineering standpoint, what's gonna make sense, but they're gonna have to solve it and figure out what's the most cost-effective way because yes, GPU prices are going down. They're going down. Everybody I think is tacitly acknowledging GPU prices have been too high as a result of the crypto mining boom. In fact, if you look at the price of performance of the 3000 and 6000 series, when they were announced, it was like, oh, the price of performance is going insane now. That was the big selling point because their audience was gamers. Then crypto miners started buying everything up and then they're like, oh yeah, we just make GPUs for a bazillion dollars. Too bad, suckers, eat it. And then that audience went away and they're like, oh, you don't want a 4080 for $1,200? I don't understand. When the 3080 was $699, you don't want this one for $1,200, almost double the price? No, we don't want that for almost double the price. That was insane. GPU prices as a result have tumbled in this generation, but AMD and Nvidia have been stubborn. They've been stubborn. They have been had to drag kicking and screaming to that point. I think the 50 series is going to be designed from the standpoint that, hey, these things need to get way more cost efficient for us to produce so we can sell them at better prices and increase price to performance. So I do expect the 50 series to be a significant step up in terms of price to performance. That being said, I think if you look at the last couple of generations, uh, Nvidia's top card, the like the what will be the I guess the 5090 will probably be a big leap, but they have had trouble scaling that performance increase as you go down the lineup, it's gotten worse and worse. Part of that is because they're using dyes that they traditionally would use like for, for instance, I think I've said this a number of times, the 4060 should be the 4050. The 4060 Ti should be the 4060. They've basically taken those dyes and they've shifted them up. So you're getting a lower quality die than you used to for a 60 series card, for a 60 Ti series card. They're doing that in order to extract more value out of you. That's why the cards barely moved in terms of performance forget price of performance, in, in terms of performance at all. And that's part of why we still recommend a 3060 12 gigabyte over the 4060 eight gigabyte because the performance is so close and it's 12 gigs of VRAM. So you might as well take it if you absolutely have to have Nvidia. But I think next generation, we're gonna see a massive shift, but we'll have to wait and see, you know, that generation's at least a year away for anything other than maybe the 5090. All right, everybody seems to be talking about this question. No Tricks and More says, is Intel going upwards with their GPUs and is Intel gonna be okay in a few years? I think you mean Intel the company. Intel the company is struggling right now. They are struggling. Huge losses right now in terms of their profitability. They've made some huge uh, cuts. It's really, really tough to, to see where Intel goes because Meteor Lake was not the success that we were told it was. I'm suspicious of Arrow Lake and all this stuff that's coming, but we'll have to wait and see. I mean, listen, AMD produced a lot of stinker CPUs out there before they got to Ryzen. Uh, Intel's clearly stumbling right now, but it doesn't mean they can't recover. But let's talk about their GPUs really quickly. I just would love to be able to recommend their GPUs to a wide audience. Can't do that yet. Can't do it yet. On the one hand, I want them to be successful, but I can't lie to people and say that this is still a product for everybody. It's not, it's getting better, but it's not there yet. And they cannot possibly be selling these GPUs for any kind of profit given the die size and probably how much it costs them to produce these things. So it's really, really tough. I Fingers crossed, fingers crossed that Intel gets it together. Fingers crossed because we don't wanna see AMD dominate the CPU market. We don't wanna see Nvidia dominate the GPU market. We've seen what that looks like. AMD sells Ryzen 
5600X for 300 bucks. They sell the 7600 for 300 bucks. And then Intel comes in with a very competitive 12th and then 13th gen, and then prices go down. Prices go down. That's what happens when there's competition. Fingers crossed that Intel pulls it together. I just can't promise you that the Intel GPU that you buy today is going to continue to be supported for years and years to come when there's some danger, at least, because of where Intel is as a company, that the GPU division could be significantly downscaled to back just integrated graphics. So fingers crossed they get into a better spot. I just can't promise you that. Let's talk a little bit about GPU maintenance, GPU performance, GPU undervolting. Yan asked, do you lose performance when undervolting a GPU? If not, why would manufacturers have them drawing so much power out of the box? Well, the answer to that, honestly, it's stability, not stability of a single GPU, but a stability of every single GPU that they're going to produce. There's always silicon differences. This is why we, you know, what we used to call golden samples, get a GPU like this, the 7600 XT. You, as a consumer, you could undervolt that. So you're basically trying to run it at the same clock speed with less voltage, right? And keep it stable. And you can tinker with it, but they have to produce tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of these GPUs, right? And they can't have even like 1% fail just from something silly like voltage. So they take a conservative approach and they apply more voltage probably than the card needs. That's why, you know, undervolting is very popular when it comes to GPUs, simply so they don't get like 3% of their cards returned. Oh, my card's constantly crashing. Like you as a person who knows how to undervolt, you could fix that. However, they're selling a lot of these GPUs to pre-built manufacturers, to, uh, to other folks out there who don't know how to fix these things and just apply a little bit more voltage if the card has instability. So that's why typically they apply more voltage than you'd think would be needed as a DIY PC person because that card's got to go to a lot of different audiences out there, many of which will just return the card if it, if it starts to crash due to stability issues. So that's why you see a lot of extra voltage on that. And that's why a lot of people do like to undervolt their GPU. But there's a couple different ways to do it. One with AMD Radeon cards, it's a one click in the adrenaline software package. You can do that. It'll look for stable undervolts for it. In fact, uh, I use that to undervolt the PowerColor Hellhound 7900 XT that we used to produce the show, basically. We are gonna put together an overclocking, a GPU overclocking and undervolting guide relatively soon where I hope to address a lot of these issues. Sell it out, artists ask kind of what on its face might seem like a crazy question, but we get these kinds of questions all the time, which is like trying to slap a Band-Aid on a gunshot wound, basically. What is my opinion on undervolting a GPU whose power consumption is otherwise too high for its PSU. Do not do that. You should replace the PSU or replace the GPU so that they are appropriately paired. So in this case, undervolting your GPU, no. Just replace the PSU if you wanna use that graphics card. Don't do something that's gonna damage your components. Even having voltage shutoffs uh, on your PC could potentially damage your PC. This is no reason to do it. Don't do these kind of things where you're trying to make a bad situation work. Fix the situation. Don't try and just slap a Band-Aid on it. We got a great question from Green Alex here on GPU maintenance. They're actually curious about when to repaste and change the thermal paste or slash pads on the CPU, but especially the GPU. What criteria have to be met? What conditions are needed for the GPU thermal pads to be exchanged? A significant increase in temperature, or is there a rule of thumb to change the pads after a few years? Not really a rule of thumb to repaste. I, I know people will say, well, every three to five years, depends on who manufactures the paste. Some paste is designed to last for up to seven years, especially on some of the GPUs. I would mostly focus in on the temperatures. If you're not happy with the temperatures on your CPU or your GPU, if they've over time just seem like they're going up and up, I would go ahead and probably repaste it and see if that solved my issue. In terms of the thermal pads, it's a little trickier because the thermal pads typically place over the memory. So you're looking for the memory temperatures. Not too many people monitor the memory temperature if you feel like it is getting too high. You know, you could certainly look at doing that. It's not something that we really address on our channel. It's something more like if you're buying a lot of used GPUs out there and those GPUs are six, seven, eight years old. Yeah, that's something you'll definitely have to think about, especially if the card's been mistreated in some way. But the thermal pads have to be the same thickness as the ones you're replacing. You can't put too much pressure on those memory chips. You can do some damage to them as well. So I would just be careful with that kind of stuff. I would mostly be looking at repasting the CPU first. That usually happens you know, three to five years. Again, depends on the paste you're using. And then of course, the GPU, I'd say more like five to seven years. But if you're having 
higher temperatures, it's always a good idea to go ahead, do a repaste, do a remounting of the cooler on either your CPU or GPU. All right, Nelson asked a great question. Do you see main gaming CPUs in the near future with good integrated graphics, or are they still basically gonna be CPUs are always better than APUs? Questions about GPU prices raising every generation. I think the Ryzen 8000 G series is a great example of why APUs are never going to be viable outside of external circumstances. The way the 5600G was viable during the GPU shortage when you couldn't sell your soul for a GPU. But as we found those APUs like the 5600G didn't perform as well as the 5600X when you added a dedicated graphics card to them and the integrated graphics were never gonna keep up with even kind of the lowliest G dedicated GPU out there. And I think we see that same thing going on with the Ryzen 8000 series APUs. To me, they don't belong in a desktop application outside of small form factor stuff. They're great for the coming handheld gaming systems where you're gonna basically be gaming at 720p on those things because the screen's only so big. So 720p is plenty of resolution for it. But in terms of a desktop, a gaming desktop like this, you were never gonna be able to reproduce the results of a, a current generation, dedicated graphics card and current generation dedicated CPU with an APU. So I just don't see them ever really being viable. And that's why I'm just not recommending the Ryzen 8000 G series, because when you add in a dedicated graphics card, the performance just woo, falls off because they don't have enough L3 cache on them because you gotta make room for those GPU cores somewhere on that CPU die and trying to slam everything into that die it's just never gonna be, you're never gonna get the best of both worlds. You're all actually gonna get kind of the worst of both worlds there. To me, that's where those APUs belong in those mobile applications. They're just never gonna be good desktop things. We also got some great questions about the future of basically computing and gaming. Anton asked, they say they don't understand the meaning of architecture in a processor. And this is highly upvoted by the way, 23 upvotes. It said so often, every time they announce a new generation, they have to look it up, but they don't understand what architecture does and how they improve it. Hope it's not too complicated. It is actually quite complicated. In a nutshell though, the architecture, if you think of like building a building, there's different ways of building a building. Same same with a CPU or a GPU architecture on there. There's very different compute units on there. There's some of the shaders. There's different things that go into being a processor. There's the input output. That's the what's called the IO. Then of course you take all that stuff and you have to arrange it onto the die, right? If you think about the little thing that you're eventually gonna get, that's the architecture. The other thing that, about the architecture is that we basically have now different sizes of processes. So for instance, Intel forever was stuck forever on 14 nanometer to the point that they couldn't shrink their process and the power usage was going off the charts and the performance wasn't. And as that process shrinks, as they get smaller and smaller and smaller, it basically reduces electrical resistance and it reduces the amount of power that you need to do anything. So all this stuff goes into it. That's what they generally mean though by architectures, the, the arrangement of the things, uh, what processes they're using. It is quite complicated, but that's it in a nutshell. Harun says, now every year or so we get a new generation of CPUs or GPUs that are better than the previous ones. How long is this gonna happen? Uh, maximum capability, I think you mean the silicon, not the silicone, but that's, uh, that's interesting. And where will the future go after that? I remember conversations that I was having with my friend who used to work at Qualcomm and he's an electrical engineer and he worked on all kinds of different stuff about, you know, back in the early 2000s about this is as far as we could possibly push these processes. We, we've been shrinking them and shrinking them. We can't shrink them much further. That was now, what, 15, 16 years ago? And look, and we're still in this game. There is, of course, physical limitations at some point to the type of computing that we're doing, but we haven't hit them yet. Uh, we've continued to develop new engineering processes that meet those challenges. I think we're still quite a ways out from reaching the full capabilities of the type of uh, processors that we put together now. There will in the future, of course, be different kinds of processors that, that may, be, may become uh, possible. But now we're getting into like sci-fi kind of future tech stuff. But right now, I, I feel like if you're worried about you know, am I still gonna be building gaming PCs 10 years from now? I think the answer is yes. Our Los Angeles Kings asks, when is Mr. Bear running for office? Well, he's already president of the universe. I mean, what higher office really could he aspire to at this point? He runs the channel and he's president of the universe. So I just, I really don't know how much further he's willing to go, but whatever office he wants to run for, he's got my vote. Couple of the quick hitters, uh, play XM. I don't really understand what CL30, CL40 means on RAM. That is too complex a question for me just to riff off the top of my head. 
It basically has to do with the latency of the RAM and it's tied to the speed as well of the overall RAM and it's also tied to the, how many transfers it does. But watch our best RAM for gaming 2023 video. I'll leave that link down in the video description under our how to build a PC playlist. We go in great detail on how to understand that and even give you the formula to understand different RAM speeds. Remember, if you got value out of this video, give it a like. This makes a huge difference to the channel, especially this guy right here who's so tired he's sleeping through the whole thing. And of course, subscribe, click that bell icon. That way you get notified when we release cool content. Hey, speaking of cool content, we did three amazing builds this month. In fact, it's a great time to build a gaming PC because prices are going up on storage and RAM. If you want to build a gaming PC, check this out right here. We go through a $750 build, a $1,200 build, and a $1,900 build, all 1440p and 4K capable. And we'll catch you on the next one. Oh, bite, 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 bite.